Hello traders, it's Wednesday, June the 21st. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly now for what we can expect for the next 24 hours ahead. Well, it seems we're fighting the dying light of volatility because, in fact, we are seeing market movement of a significant degree, and particularly uh, in certain areas of the financial spectrum. Uh, we did have a noteworthy shift in risk trends generally across the asset classes that we track as uh, more sentiment oriented markets. Uh, most notable the equity indexes around the world uh, including the S&P 500 did show a varying degree of correction. The S&P 500, as you can see, had quite a significant pullback, retracing the Monday gap open, or at least the progress that we made in the actual uh, body of the candle, if you will. Didn't really close the window on the gap, though. Uh, we had, through the European session, the FTSE 100 pulling back, uh, continuing to form what is uh, loosely a head and shoulders pattern, uh, but generally struggling to retake uh, that high that we had set at the beginning of the month. The DAX, the German Equity Index, uh, did open higher and corrected, but the Asia Equity Indexes had an even more impressive gap higher and, and modest retracement uh, that you see here on the Nikkei 225. It's uh, not necessarily indicative of the full reversal that actually it seemed as we just saw going backwards in time in, chrono in a chronological order, uh, sentiment uh, had actually faded into uh, the Tuesday session. So risk aversion gained traction along the way. Question is whether we actually have follow through on this into uh, the upcoming trading day. Remains to be seen. But it does tell us one thing that we should not just fall back on the assumptions that everything is going to be quiet because of seasonal factors. Yes, seasonal factors matter, and yes, uh, we know that the VIX are the representation of volatility in the broader financial system, as exposed by the SP 500, which is uh, what this is derived from. June is a quiet month, st statistically speaking, but it doesn't always have to be quiet. And just because the entire month is quiet does not mean we're not going to have uh, bursts of activity throughout the period. So be on the lookout. Don't be uh, complacent with the record or proximity to record highs that we have on benchmarks like the U.S. equity indexes. So. We do have a little bit of a slip on sentiment, but it's hardly what we would call a clear risk aversion move. So if you're predicating a trade uh, based on sentiment on the S&P 500, for example, I watch the S&P 500, I think is a great benchmark. It is a exceptional benchmark for sentiment, not because it's a perfect one for one uh, reaction to the sentiment, but rather because it is so skewed to one side. It is fully engaged on risk on, but when it starts to pull back, you know that there must be something uh, shaking the foundations of that confidence. So I like it for that reason. It's not particularly uh, your day to day assessment, but it is a very clear benchmark. So I'm going to keep a close eye on this and see if we actually have something from it, but it's not going to be the catalyst that sends me to short you know, equity indexes or uh, other risk-oriented currencies like the yen crosses or even the dollar as a risk-oriented currency. As you can see, we didn't have a negative day from the dollar. And if risk aversion were actually kicking in, I do believe that we would have uh, an unwinding of dollar-long exposures as a carry trade. We'll get to that in a second, though. Another reason to be doubtful that we're really engaging in something more systemic uh, is the volatility measures that we're keeping closer tra track of as of late, and well, we should. This is the VIX volatility index. As you can see, we are just south of 11, uh, but context, context, context. It is still extremely quiet and not a good reason to take any kind of medium-term views on a deleveraging of risk exposure, as extreme as it might be, not really picking up. And this is not just an assessment of this as a pure indicator, it's also an assessment of it as a uh, trading utensil, whether that be the VXX, the Leverage Short-Term Volatility ETF, which not even picking up, picking off its lows, or we can look at something like the medium-term volatility index or 
even the inverted XIB, uh, not really showing the sensitivity to the retracement or reversal. But it also uh, goes uh, with the volatility indexes for other asset classes. We noted uh, on Monday session the drop that we had in the euro-based volatility index from the CBOE. You can see that we're still very low on this uh, measure. Uh, we also have the GVZ, which uh, noteworthy through the end of last week had actually hit a series low for this indicator. Uh, and the emerging market volatility ETF or index, sorry, uh, that is extremely low as well. All, right, all of these have barely nudged from their extraordinarily low levels, and given that they are treated as speculative assets with uh, f uh, fundamental or thematic leverage behind it, they're usually very responsive to what you know, are considered to be substantive moves. So unless these are really going to go for it, it's probably not a good idea to get heavily invested against what we know to be a seasonal uh, statistical norm. Back to the dollar. The dollar did have a noteworthy uh, day. In a very, the very technical sense, the DXY dollar index, the ICE's measure, uh, actually did reverse this inverse head and shoulders neckline. So you can see the neckline here. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, dubious on a pure technical basis because we didn't really form perfectly the right shoulder. It didn't actually touch right here. but. I think for most intents and purposes, you cleared that milestone. It doesn't mean that it's going to easily run. Uh, there is actually a midpoint on this run from May 2016 to the high that we set at the beginning of the year. Midpoint, or as many people say, 50% Fib, although it's not actually a, a Fibonacci sequence number, uh, 9790 essentially. Uh, that still stands. We'll see if we can actually get back above that, and that could be a subsequent milestone, and it can if cleared, perhaps give another degree of uh, confidence for those that want to uh, be long dollar. Uh, because I do think that there are good opportunities out there for long dollar if we can uh, really gain traction on it. Euro USD has the mirror of the dollar index. It is essentially a head and shoulders pattern. And if we cleared 111, it certainly would go a long way to moving back into range. So it's not perhaps the most glorious move, uh, glamorous move, and uh, uh, kind of champion the trend, but it is a path of least resistance, which makes it actually all the more appealing. If we move back into this broad range, that is something that's more capable of what's in, within the market's reach, because these are markets that are not prone to easy run on trends without provocation. So I'm looking for a break of 111 to see if it uh, inspires greater confidence with the pullback, but it's already starting, it already has been making uh, pretty good strides towards that bearish view. Uh, Dollar Cat is the other one that has been really at the top of my uh, my list. You can see here that uh, it certainly has bounced again off of that rising trend line, and to remind you how far back that trend line support goes, uh, you can see it actually begins arguably back here in January 2015. So we bounce off that. It hasn't cleared its recent highs, which is just north of 133, uh, but it does uh, pick up some significant support. Now, I should say that this came with some additional uh, uh, complementing conviction, and that's actually oil. Oil, uh, looking at the futures market here, actually drove lower on the day. Uh, pardon the futures. It looks like it doesn't have the full candle. But we had a critical break of 44. All right, that is a important technical level of support that we've been talking about. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's easy sailing for uh, bears, but it certainly does reflect a substantial technical clearance. And going back to the dollar CAD, that is a significant pressure because what has not just been the dollar side of things, another factor that has been contributing and really, uh, well, uh, has been raising a lot of flags is the typical relationship between dollar CAD and oil, which oil here is inverted, or flips upside down. Uh, they have been deviating significantly as of late, and now that we have pushed be and below 44, or higher on this chart because it is flipped upside down, uh, that adds an additional pressure for this currency pair to reconverge. 
especially with the dollar picking up some traction and it ignoring that uh, lift as well. So this arguably has two very different fundamental supports behind it, technicals backing it, and in some ways that this is a, a more appealing uh, fundamental backdrop than even the Euro USD. So I'll keep an eye on this one as well. Other dollar-based crosses uh, had more uh, restrained appeal to them, pound dollar, more pound uh, performance, but a significant move on the day. We'll talk about that in a second. Aussie USD didn't really gain a lot of traction. Kiwi USD didn't gain a lot of traction. Not surprised there. We have a RBNZ rate decision, which we'll talk about. Uh, and the dollar Swiss not really uh, ever doing anything other than what the euro allows it. So not a universal dollar-based move, really concentrated in particular crosses, meaning we're getting, we're borrowing a lot of the progress from counter-currency inflows rather than the dollar itself. Now, despite the dollar's lack of performance and the uh, equity markets, U.S. equity markets, uh, fading confidence, we did have some very Im influential developments, some of them positive, uh, from the U.S. through this past session. In fact, on the political front, which are, is usually a constant risk, and nothing that's really been, it was scheduled, uh, uh, was the announcement that the uh, health care bill, bill would be brought through the Senate uh, this week. All right, so generating progress towards more important legislation from the market's view, and that is this is a milestone or a necessary step towards tax reform. And the White House suggested it would release tax reform uh, bill uh, that can be obviously debated in Congress uh, in the first two weeks of September. So regaining some traction on one of those two big programs that have been uh, arguably responsible for much of the quote-unquote Trump rally, uh, the confidence that we would have tax reform and infrastructure spending introduced in a fast-tracked method uh, to help spur growth and spur revenue in return. Uh, obviously, neither has come so far, and a lot of uncertainty has built around that. Now, the fact that we still had a slip on the day despite these promises means that words are not worth as much as they were in the past. We're not willing to uh, buy up rumor consistently without some kind of confirmation that we're going to get a uh, payout on those views. So we'll see what uh, comes of these uh, continued remarks. And if anything new comes from the infrastructure program, which still is dangling out uh, in the wind. Also, and this is surprising from the dollar's perspective, the Fed collectively had four speakers, Evans, Rosengren, Fisher, and Kaplan. All right. Now, Evans was skeptical for future rate hikes in 2017 and beyond because he was concerned about inflation. He's on the dovish spectrum, not surprising. Uh, we had Kaplan, who said he was confident in rate hikes. He's more on the hawker spectrum, not a surprise. Uh, more interesting was Fed, uh, Fed Fisher, who's vice chair, suggesting that the housing market is expensive, uh, prices are very high, and that they would do more to promote financial uh, stability. Uh, and even more interesting is Rosengren, who is quickly becoming something of a vocal uh, reflection of the markets and financial stability when he suggested that low rates are indeed uh, a possible risk contri contribution to financial stability. Now, this was not necessarily a warning shot uh, cast by a explicitly concerned member. That's more the um, uh, the orientation of Mester, but. It certainly does speak to, you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, Rosengren was very clear dove uh, that these concerns are starting to be put to the forefront. Usually these are cheerleaders. They don't say anything that can spook the markets. Not as concerned anymore. And that's not surprising given that they're able to hike rates and even the doves can get behind rate hikes in the uh, early planning to w draw down on some of that stimulus. But you have to confront this. You have to confront the fact that there is financial stability risk, especially with markets as richly valued as they are. And ignoring it, uh, which many people believe that central makers do, uh, doesn't do you any benefits. It essentially says that you're not prepared for it. So they're trying to, it seems, use their uh, 
uh, their remarks, their forecast, their guidance uh, on this particular element of the market. I don't think it'll work out too well, though. Uh, you can admit that you recognize these issues, but your recognition is not going to buy you any favors for market stability. So that complacency, not going to be uh, disarmed by the Fed. So, remarkable, and we will have more Fed speak going forward, although the docket is relatively light uh, in the next 24 hours. We will get back to it subsequently. Now, with the active uh, dollar-based majors, I, I did note quickly that the pound dollar had a significant drop. This was not dollars doing. The dollar was a a, a modest uh, bullish currency this past session. This move, which actually brings us to a, our lowest level since uh, essentially mid-late April, uh, is motivated by the pound. The pound dropped uh, pretty universally against this cross, this euro, uh, euro pound, moving back towards that 88.50 level, uh, pound Aussie, pound CAD, even pound yen uh, with a balanced risk view. Uh, the pound was generally under pressure this past session because we had two things. Um, those two things were monetary policy views and Brexit. Brexit really is the, the commanding influence here, but hey, uh, it didn't really matter this, this time because they actually uh, coincided. Uh, the factor that was not uh, on my radar uh, was Governor Carney's uh, comments. Um, he was in a planned speech had actually downgraded uh, the market's expectations that uh, perhaps the central bank was getting closer and closer to that first rate hike. Um, you recall that last week the Bank of England uh, showed that its MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, had three members who voted for tightening. That had led to expectations that maybe the central bank was much more uh, much closer to actually hiking rates than many had anticipated and indeed it does encourage me to move uh, the bank of england standing up this curve and potentially slightly above neutral but carney being the governor uh, still treating it as a democracy but his views are that we're still a ways away from uh, that rate hike despite inflation as we've seen recently but the more important factor here is that uh, we are two days into the Brexit uh, negotiations between the EU and the UK, and it seems that there's no fast-tracking uh, the decision for trade open trade agreements um, and that uh, the EU is not going to back off readily on some of the things that it requires. Uh, media uh, and the headlines had, well, depending on where you look and what country the, the media is from. Uh, they, they deemed it a, a win on the day for the EU. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of days like this where it's back and forth and uh, there's going to be more aggressive uh, jabs thrown by these various negotiators. Um, but you can expect the pound is going to remain very sensitive. Probably going to struggle for uh, a lasting trend, but it can certainly be the source of of some sharp moves, maybe a, a multi-day run, uh, but generally sharp moves, uh, knee-jerk response to headlines. So if you're trading pound, account for that. Now, looking into the next 24 hours, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the pound. Obviously, Brexit uh, is a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, the dollar is on a technical move, but if it makes sense, it's a technical, in the most technical sense, development. It is really just a, a bear break with not a lot of conviction behind it. And really what I look for when I see a technical break, and I think that it has some substance to it, I look for the fundamental motivation. I have to look for something that would say, all right, what would encourage non-technical traders to get behind this move? And if you're going to throw it behind, uh, throw it back to last week's Fed decision, which was a week ago, and you think that that's going to be the motivation, you're probably expecting too much. If it couldn't motivate it a week ago in a significant way, there's no reason why it's all of a sudden going to accelerate, unless something substantial comes down the line that uh, ramps up uh, the market's expectations or re really reinforces the Fed's views, uh, which we're not getting. So. I'm limiting my expectations here. There certainly is some degree of uh, event risk on the docket, but none of it's really high profile 
I mean, the existing home sales. Uh, we'll put to, to, the, to the test of concern some of the Fed's officials' uh, views on the housing market and financial stability with low rates, but uh, that's not going to be enough uh, to really generate that clear and consistent move from the dollar. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, it's a no-go on the euro USD or the dollar CAD. These do have their own appeals to them respectively, uh, and as long as the fundamentals don't get in the way, they don't necessarily have to contribute to a, a fast move within these, these ranges. Moving back into the ranges is a path least resistance, and it can achieve its own move. I'll also keep a close eye on the, S, uh, the USD CNH, which is the Chinese Yuan. Uh, this past session, actually just uh, about an hour and a half ago from where I'm recording, uh, the MSCI, the world's largest purveyor of ETFs, uh, decided that it, ha it would allow uh, Chinese A shares, the high quality shares onshore, um, to be incorporated into its uh, emerging market ETF, which is, uh, it's, a, it's the market's version of the Chinese Yuan being inducted into the SDR, the IMF's Sovereign Drawing Rights Basket which makes it arguably reserve currency. But this has that kind of influence. But just like the SDR, which I'm sure the IMF kind of uh, has uh, indigestion about on a regular basis because of the heavy-handed influence that the Chinese uh, authorities are Im implementing over the exchange rate, uh, the the MSCI is going to have significant adjustment too. Uh, you cannot say that the uh, Chinese shares, I mean, this is the ASHR, um, you can also use the uh, FXI, which is another large uh, Chinese representative ETF, but this had a, a speculative boom. It had a bust, and it had the Chinese authorities step in to stabilize everything. I mean, this is the... Um, ideal of, of extremes and market influence uh, from broad officials. And this all happened just in the past couple of years. All right, this is not decades ago through r rounds and rounds of regulation and, and market opening efforts. This is two years ago. So keep that in mind. All right. And I want to see how this uh, impacts the views on the Chinese investment, capital inflow and outflow of China, which is partially reflected in the exchange rate, but this is certainly one of those important big picture profile considerations that will dictate our investment over the long term. Maybe not a dollar yuan trade in the next week, which I would not recommend unless you have clear views on what the Chinese authorities are doing, um, but it will tell us whether China is going to be a uh, target investment destination uh, in the years uh, to come. Now, the top event risk over the next 24 hours, and it's not really a dense economic docket. You know, you have the BOJ governor speaking, you have uh, net uh, public sp sector spending and borrowing uh, from the UK. But the top event risk by far, and it's not a, not easy to uh, to overcome those, is the RBNZ rate decision. So Kiwi dollar is on the radar. Uh, the Kiwi USD does have some congestion here after some volatile week of trading, uh, and it certainly has some technical boundaries that, if motivated properly, can easily and readily clear. Now, the RBNZ rate decision, which I will be covering live in a webinar, uh, may seem like a non-event, and uh, the more likely outcome here is that the RBNZ decides that it's going to hold rates unchanged. All right, that's the most likely outcome, but like I've warned with the Bank of Japan last week, the RBNZ has the tendency to not project its intended moves. It is not a Fed. It is not an ECB. It is not a BOE. It is not one of these major central banks which will use forward guidance to help mitigate some of the volatility that their decisions, their policy changes, can have in the market. In fact, they seem to in, in, enjoy their impact on the market. And this is particularly important for the RBNZ. As I uh, laid out before, it's good to ask yourself the question pretty semi-regularly, why is the New Zealand dollar considered one of the major currencies of the world? It's not because of the size of your economy. It's not because capital has a natural rotation through that country on its way to other places around the world, but rather because it is a high credit rating and a high yield. The problem is its yield is not much higher than what the U.S. benchmark rate is now. So 
is quickly becoming a liability when I could just go to the US dollar for an equivalent rate of return. That is not going to be something lost upon New Zealand policy officials. So there is a rising possibility that the RBNZ decides that it wants to hike. Maybe not go for an aggressive policy of tightening, because it could very readily trip uh, a uh, housing market crisis in, the New in New Zealand. But it certainly is a high probability that they start down this path. And that would significantly alter the standing of the New Zealand dollar, which to this point was whatever risk on risk off is doing or, you know, whatever the its counterpart is doing, it will essentially go along for the ride. We can have a much more motivated New Zealand dollar going forward if the RBNZ does something and gives us uh, uh, a clear view. If the RBNZ just stays with its uh, modestly dovish to neutral view, then the dollar can regain uh, some, some traction here like it has with some of the other majors and uh, tentatively go for a technical break and back into a range here. That's a opportunity. You can also look for some of these other uh, recent uh, buildups for the Kiwi, which the Euro Kiwi is a very good one, uh, as is the Pound Kiwi, and potentially can see something of a bounce. Now, a Pound Kiwi break is going to need Brexit, so I would be cautious of that. Alternatively, if the RBNZ decides it wants to start ramping up the rate hike engine, uh, then seeing a breakdown here, seeing a breakdown here, and definitely seeing a breakdown and break up here is more likely. And that can have some run to it, especially if risk trends hold out or at least are neutral. There's two things you can do for a carry currency. Either you can see its carry interest rise significantly, or you can just see the general appetite of the market for carry increase and that's going to help rally the kiwi so if you want to get away from the secondary interests and influences like the u.s dollars facing or the yen or the pound for brexit uh, take a look at the aussie kiwi and take a look at the kiwi cat all right these are unusual crosses but they're still pretty liquid and they don't get much interference from these other fundamental themes which can uh, create a difficult uh, spectrum of things to watch all right so we'll cover that event live if you can come join me uh, in the meantime keep an eye on risk trends through things like the S&P 500 and VIX. Uh, keep an eye on the pound as it continues to deal with uh, what's happening with the Brexit negotiations from day to day and see if that dollar can gain some, some traction. All right, it's only moving back into a range, but it needs at least some conviction to get through uh, some more immediate resistance. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.